Welcome to Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust's virtual conference, Sharing Our Seas, Seals and People. We are excited to share an inspirational series of talks, exploring a variety of aspects of seal conservation in the UK. And it's our 20th birthday. In that time, we've done 35,000 plus surveys, processed over a million photos for 72,000 plus seal IDs. To make sure we can continue this important work, Check out our website to join our Wild Seal Supporter Scheme, back our crowdfunding campaign or shop in our online store. Thank you for your support. Hi, I'm Katie and I work as the Research Ranger at Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust. My role involves working alongside Sue and our scientific advisors to produce reports and journal papers from our massive 20 year data set as well as develop and manage new research projects. These include supervising student projects and coordinating our current human activity and SEAL surveys. One of our fantastic scientific advisors is here, Bex Allen. We're going to talk to you today about CSGRT's research. It's always good to be introduced as fantastic. That's nice. Um, so my name is Rebecca Allen. Uh, everybody knows me as Bex. I work for Cornwall College in my full-time role, so I'm a programme manager on the marine programmes uh, degrees there. And I've been working with Sue on SEALs since about 2003. That has carried on through the years. Uh, we've just sort of evolved together really, uh, helping shape how we collect the data and what, and what we do with it. So we first met um, through Stephen Westcott, who at the time was doing some research on SEALs and he kind of, I think, was both responsible for introducing both of us to SEALs and infecting us with his passion. Um, and then we met up with the SEAL ID catalogues and discovered two people that were doing the same uh, crazy work of trying to match SEAL patterns and track individuals uh, over time. Um, so it was really exciting to find somebody else who was doing the same thing. And that's developed into a great friendship over the years and also you know, this, this shared interest. And, I like to feel I've, I've really helped the group along the way by um, bringing in some sort of scientific expertise and helping to make the data collection a little more rigorous, um, which has you know, enabled it to sort of stand up to the test of time, really. Uh, and Sue and I, we've both taught each other things about data collection um, and, and understanding SEALs over the years. So it's been a really synergistic relationship. I mean, we're talking about data, but um, where does our data actually come from? Um, and the majority of the data is actually citizen science based, uh, meaning that we rely on amazing volunteers who head out all over the coast to survey um, throughout the southwest of England. From 2000 to 2008, Sue Sayer and Kate Hockley started systematically surveying their local patch on West Cornwall. And then from 2008 onwards, we've had um, our fantastic volunteer network heading out to multiple sites all around the southwest um, to monitor seals. To give you an idea on just how much data we collect each year, in 2019 alone, 376 volunteers sent in 3,284 records from 399 different places. This resulted in over 120,000 photos being processed, um, which achieved 8,722 individual SEAL IDs. I mean, that is a lot of data. Um, and it also includes ad hoc SEAL sightings from many members of the public as well. This amount of photo identification data, it really helps us to understand um, SEAL ecology better, and also a little bit more about individual animal movements as well as whole populations. Our particular systematic surveys um, includes our boat surveys along the north coast of Cornwall and our recent project looking into wildlife disturbance. CSGRT have also collected important data um, that involves lost fishing, fishing gear, microplastics and much much more. I guess the remit of the group has grown quite a bit hasn't it just from seals it's 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 increase the interest of people with sort of like the, the network of volunteers initially started out being interested in seals and then because of that interest they've become in also involved in the wider marine environment which is a really exciting part of the work of the group and just sort of getting your head around one year's worth of data that's an incredible amount of sightings which 
starts to give you an insight about some of the problems behind the scenes in collating all that data. It's, it's incredibly powerful, but it's got to be systematically stored in order to analyze it correctly. When Sue was first starting to work on this, the data was just entered into a, a spreadsheet and she was keeping systematic records. Uh, she was doing that based on sightings days every day. And then um, when it came to trying to collate that to sort of get information about which seals had been seen where and what locations had how many seals, she had to do all of that collation and processing fairly manually, which is really time consuming. And, and it soon got to the point with more and more people sending sightings that that was just really getting unmanageable in terms of the amount of time and also the suitability of the system to collate that. So Jeff Loveridge um, helped initially evolve the, the, the database for the group. Um, and over the years, I've chipped in as well. We've, we've tweaked the design. So now that's quite a powerful system for collecting that sightings data. And we can rapidly link up seals and seal IDs. So we can pull up statistics, for example, where have seals have been seen um, over a certain time frame. So that's, we can track individuals, look at you know, where they've been seen the most, um, where they go. We can also do that by location. So what seals have been seen where, how many have been seen for particular time frames, and where do those seals from those locations go as well. And that's given us a lot more power to do a lot more with the data. And also we can respond to inquiries really quickly now as well. So that's helped us work with groups like Natural England, at the Environment Agency, when they've got particular inquiries about what might be going on with seals in a, in a region. So all of our data is stored in this database, as Bex has explained, but what do we actually do with the data? Um, we can't just leave it sitting there, it's too useful. Um, so we use it to contribute to achieving and informing effective conservation for seals and also the wider marine environment, including um, things like reports, scientific posters, talks for both the scientific community at conferences um, and also the general public, uh, important public consultations, and also peer-reviewed papers, which Bex is going to talk to you a little bit about. One of the first scientific papers we published was in 2012, and that was about the entanglement of seals in discarded um, fishing gear. And it started first with Sue asking me whether I'd seen seals with entanglement injuries, and that was way back in probably 2003. And we started thinking about it and how we could get data about this issue, because we realised as we started looking at the seals, we were seeing more and more of these animals uh, with these injuries. So we ended up in 2008 reviewing data that had been collected at that point by the group um, and reviewing photo idea data from the St Ives Bay wild site. We found that on average between 3.6 and 5% of seals seen there were entangled in some sort of marine debris. And um, that's about one in 20 seals, which is, you know, it's quite a staggeringly high amount. Um, and some with fairly horrific injuries. We, we judged that serious injuries are those where they've got open wounds or serious constrictions around their body or neck. And about 64% of those injuries that we saw were what we would deem serious as in kind of life-threatening or interfering with their, um, their welfare. Uh, more recently, we've gone on to be looking at things like seal networks and movements. So highlighting the power of uh, citizen science and volunteer groups. So in 2019, we published a paper called Pinnipeds, People and Photo Identification. Um, which highlighted how far seals are moving. We've got this incredible network now. We've been able to track seals from Wales uh, down to France. And that's, that's really great. That's just told us so much more about where our seals go and what sites are important to them. And current projects include collating data. Um, there was another citizen science project about uh, fishing gear, um, which use the power of the Cornwall Seal Group network to um, survey fishing gear that was washing up on the coast uh, around Cornwall. So we're in the middle, middle of collating that data um, for publication at the moment. Um, and another important recent project was looking at release seals. So over the years, um, the Seal Sanctuary has done some great work rehabbing um, seal pups and then releasing them back into the wild. And we had a request from the National Trust about working with that data. Now, Katie is the one that's done a lot of the work on that. So I'll hand over to her just to talk a little bit more about that request. Uh, yeah, so um, basically we were requested um, by the National Trust to have a look into whether releasing 
um, rehabilitated seals in areas that were close to wild haul-out sites, whether that would affect the wild seals and um, the movements of the released pups. So it was really interesting. It, we actually found out that, um, that there is no um, effect at the particular site that we looked at in West Cornwall. Um, there's no effect on the releasing um, rehabilitated seals into the wild on the adjacent wild population. I mean, these pups, they travel such long distances. They're seen in many, many different places um, all around the Southwest. Um, and even some of them have been linked to um, further afield. So it was one of those um, projects that highlights the importance of collaboration because so many different organizations were involved, including the Cornish Seal Sanctuary, um, RSPCA West Hatch Wildlife Hospital, the National Trust, British Divers Marine Life Rescue, Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust, the University of Exeter, um, Cornwall College Newquay, I mean, just countless um, amounts of people. Were, we were able to produce a piece of work um, that we're very proud of and um, at the moment have submitted for peer review. Yeah, which is really, really exciting. Um, and it, it sort of highlights that really symbiotic relationship that has grown in Cornwall between different organisations, but especially for the Cornwall Seal Group, uh, the, we've got great relationships with um, the different colleges and universities, especially the local ones, uh, the University of Plymouth and the University of Exeter and Cornwall College, all locally. The universities and colleges benefit from that kind of real world access to the community of citizen sciences. I think it's helped break down the kind of ivory tower and local community um, barriers that were there and it's really helped uh, both groups work together. Um, it's been, a, it's been a, an important bridge I think the Cornwall Seal Group in doing that. Um, so they benefit from that access to this, this enormous data collection that's going on and their students can do projects and benefit from workshops. I think Katie you've been involved in delivering a few workshops to uh, different university groups which has been great. Um, and then the, the Cornwall Seal Group has also benefited massively from that input from researchers at the universities. So the scientific advice um, from people such as uh, Dr. Matt Witt um, and Lucy Hawke has been fantastic in building our capacity and also our rigour and, and giving us the, the benefit of their um, reputation and, and experience in doing things like publishing papers and getting funding bids and, and research design as well. Yeah, well, Bex, you're included in that list as well, yeah. of course. <laughs> oh, thank you very um, much. But, um, you know, something that's also been a benefit is, um, you know, being able to support a range of different students over the years. Um, they've been able to look at lots of different aspects of SEAL research. Um, and we've had students from so many different institutions, more than I can actually list, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. Um, but what what's really important for CSGRT is that working with students is absolutely a win-win situation because we tend to learn as much from them um, and their supervisors and the work that they produce as they do from us. And an example of this is that we've had students this year make a huge contribution to developing um, and conducting our larger research project, um, the People Protecting Precious Places, um, which looks at wildlife disturbance. Yeah, and actually, um, just to say that the reason that I got involved with SEALs was because I did a student project um, with Bex as my supervisor. Um, and it just shows, you know, where those projects can actually lead. The, the benefits to the students, uh, it's, it's just really nice to be able to work with an, uh, an outside organisation. And for them, they feel like they're not just doing a study that's of interest to themselves and just the supervisor and it's, you know, collecting data which is, is fine, but they're actually contributing to a larger picture. Yourself, you did a great project on photo ID, which really enabled more understanding of what was going on in that particular local site. Um, and I've, I've seen other students benefiting from, from going out and just being able to, you know, seals are such a charismatic species, it just makes really fascinating projects. You can't beat going out and collecting real world data like that, I don't think. Okay, so one of the benefits of having a great data set, which is also long term, is that it can feed quite meaningfully into conservation. Um, and there's never been a more important time to be able to feed meaningfully into conservation. The marine environment is under 
a massive amount of pressure, um, particularly from climate change, from fishing, um, from human disturbance uh, of wildlife. Um, the list can, can go on and on. It's really important that one, you have good data uh, to try and one, make change because a lot of um, people in power that can make changes to how protection work need and want evidence in order for them to act in the first place. And two, you've got to make sure that that protection or action that happens is the right type of work to do. So poor protection decisions can be make situations worse. Um, they can make bad feeling and they can mean that the protection is actually ineffective for habitats and species as well. And the Cornwall Seal Group, you know, it's got the benefit of this really long running and pretty rigorous data set, um, which has enabled us to make some important contributions. I think just going back to the entanglement paper, that highlighted an important fact for our area, showing how um, serious the entanglement rate was with seals. And it was one of the highest for species that's been reported, really, especially at that time. Um, it, and it's still at a very high level. But that paper has gone on to be used in other publications. It's been cited many times, including at the highest sort of international levels in UN reports. Um, so th that kind of information then can you know, leverage action. One result of it, we were involved with the World Animal Protection um, a, a charity that produced an international project um, to act on ghost gear, uh, bringing in researchers from all over the world. And we were part of that, enabling them to sort of move forward with what they were going to do to try and tackle this problem. Other examples are the, are the other paper I mentioned, the P People and Pinniped, Pinnipeds paper, which highlights a network of seals and where they move and what sites are important. And that's helped to inform decisions about whether we can put more in protection in place for particular sites, um, such as special areas of conservation, because those do uh, have an umbrella function where, you know, if there are linkages to other sites, those other sites can have protections from the special area of conservation as well. So it's helped to enable a bit more protection for seals because of that. Uh, so that was um, just a whistle-stop tour of um, CSGRT's research. Make sure you check out our other talks. Um, they go into more detail about the boat surveys and photo ID work. On behalf of all of us here at Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust, I'd like to thank all of our amazing volunteers, without whom we wouldn't have been able to collect some of the most comprehensive and long-term data on grey seals in the world. I'd like to thank our funders, both past and present, without whom we wouldn't be able to continue to do this important research, enabling us to give our globally rare grey seals a voice. I'd also, of course, like to thank our amazing scientific advisors, including Bex, of course, um, who have helped to continue to maintain our scientific standards and produce top quality work. So hopefully this will continue into the future. Well, thanks. Um, I really enjoyed having a chat about the work we've been doing today. And um, thank you. I hope those of you that have uh, listened to the talk uh, would come by and say, ask some questions for us on the 4th of July. It'd be great to see you then.